live his fame and long live his glory and long may his story be Sit down. Thank you. I'm holding the edition for your acceptance speech, Wyatt. Well, you better keep on holding it because I'm not accepting it. What? Well, who ever heard of a marshal as chairman of a baby contest? But, Marshal, you must accept. Those dreadful gamblers are even making book on the babies. Well, that's legal, ma'am. The gossip is simply dreadful. Some people are actually hinting that Our Lady's Aid Society approves of the gamblers. Well, Let's look at what the facts are, Mrs. Beeler. You set up a contest and you asked everybody in town to vote for their favorite baby at 25 cents a vote. Is that right? That's right. Now, you asked everybody. And the gamblers all pitched in, cutting into their own poker pots for vote money. And, and you ladies were very happy to get the contribution. And why not? The money's for the best of purposes, Mr. Earp. But we need you, Mr. Earp, or this honest charity may break up in a scandalous mess. What the ladies mean is this, Wyatt. With you chairman of the contest, the gamblers wouldn't dare try anything mm. crooked. No. And that'll give the people in town confidence to go on voting. Yes, you? yes, yes. And we could award the $200 prize to Wichita's prize baby, knowing it had been elected honestly. Well, look, look, Mrs. Beeler, uh, I mean, the chairman of a baby contest, uh, well, what if a big cow hand uh, should dare me to well, change one of the babies or something. But you could do it, Mr. Earp. You're such a resourceful man. <laughs> sure. Mr. Earp, Mr. Earp. Oh, no. Excuse me, ladies, but Denver Jones wants a marshal right away. There's trouble over at the Wichita Saloon. Now, what kind of trouble, Jeff? Well, Denver's been taking 10% of all the money and putting it into the baby contest. Yes, I know that. Well, this young fella got cleaned out. Now he wants his kitty money back. You see, Marshal, these things put our contest in such a bad light. What did I tell you? Uh, yes, ladies, what... <laughs> you go tell Denver I got twice as much trouble as you'll ever have. Uh, but this young fellow's gone for his guns. Well, that makes it a little different. Uh, excuse me, ladies, and uh, Mr. Murdoch. Marshal, that's him. There he goes into the Texas hotel where he checked his guns. Joe, that young fellow looked mad enough to make a real rough house. Guess we better get out of sight. But Marshal. Where's that boss dealer with a slick tongue? You're a little overdressed, aren't you, stranger? This scrub cow town marshal's gonna tell me whether I can wear a gun or not. Where's Denver Jones? Well, I'm sitting in for him right now. Yeah? Who are you? Name's Zerp. I never heard of you. Since you're feeding on his range, you can hand over that 30 bucks he held out on me. You see that sign? There's a sign like that in every card room in town. And everyone is buying votes for his favorite baby. I never saw the babies. I've never been in this town before and I'm cleaned out. I want that cut he took off my lucky pots to go on playing. Well, seeing as you're a stranger here, I guess I better introduce myself properly. I'm that scrub Cowtown Marshal. I just want that money awful bad to want to kill a man for it. Yeah, I need it. And I'll get it. You want to work for it? You don't look like the gunfighter type to me. A lot of jobs around. I can't wait that long. You're going to have to wait in jail overnight. Now, since you bought $30 worth, I'll give you a ballot so you can vote for one of the babies. <laughs> Let's check this for you so it doesn't give you any more trouble. <laughs> We're on the same old room, Sam. I'm the double. Key, fire, water, and tobacco. Oh, go stab yourself, wasn't it? 
You boys are a little bit behind the times, aren't you? What'd you say? First, I want you to check your gun. Second, I want you to pay for the hole in the carpet. And third, I want you to behave yourself while you're here in Wichita. Who says? I do. Well, who are you? I'm the marshal here. The name is Earp. Wyatt Earp? This is Marshal Earp, men. We, uh, we heard about you. <laughs> well, go on. Check your guns like the man said. What do you suppose they were close to knit that hole in the carpet? Hold it! I'm all right. You see, I've given you ladies a big spread here on page one. Oh, that's wonderful. The greatest what? What? Sure. Any real trouble, Wyatt? I won one and lost one. I met a young fellow with a very fast horse. Ladies, your contest is causing more ruckus than I realized. I'll take that chairmanship. Oh, oh wonderful. Bless you. Come on, let's find the good news. Everybody's wonderful. After letting some saddle tramp run over me like that, I guess babies are about all I can handle. Come on, Wyatt, tell me all about it. Well, I... Say, those nice ladies aren't afraid someone had rigged their play, are they? Well, not now, they're not. But Joe, uh, here's a list of the official rules. Will you post them for me so everybody can read them? Sure. If anybody gives you any trouble, why, you just give me a call, huh? Sure will, Marshal. There you are. It's a good haul. Good night. Good night, Marshal. Are you all right, man? Is there a doctor? One who knows something about babies? Well, there's Dr. Fabrique, ma'am. He, he treats all ages. I'm afraid she's pretty sick. His office is just down the street here. Let me help you. <laughs> Look all tuckered out, man. Where'd you come from? We were on our way here from Dodge City. My husband was killed on the trail. Now, now don't you worry. Doc will take good care of both of you. It's a good thing the Lord makes babies extra tough. How long have you been jolting this kid around in the hot sun? Is she very sick? Exhaustion. Hunger and wind colic. The smartest thing I can do for her now is do nothing. <laughs> Let her rest. I uh, brought you a sandwich and some milk. Thank you, Mr. Earp. Will Susie be all right, Doctor? Well. In the hands of a baby specialist, I wouldn't give her much chance. But I ain't no baby specialist. Go on, eat something. Oh, sit here, Jenna. Thank you. Can't I give her some of this milk if I warm it? No. Who's handling this case? Uh, Doc is an expert on babies. Do you uh, have any friends here in town? No, no, I don't. And I'll uh, have to get Susie and you a room at the hotel. Well, I, I can't pay for it, Marshal. If they let me work it out, I haven't much money left. I haven't any. But I'll get a job and I'll pay you, Doctor. Uh, wait to earn some money. And don't gobble so fast. Quiet. You and I had better have a consultation. Well, just take it easy. And, uh, Doc acts mean, it's a sure sign the patient's going to recover. He sure is a cute kid. Will she be all right? I got the big baby on my mind now. Suppose you get her a job swinging hash in one of the hotels. I don't know. She doesn't look that strong. She's just the kind of mother to have a kid in the baby contest. Hey. She's broke. She's hungry. Hey, that's a wonderful idea. But uh, do you think you can get Susie well quick enough? With $200 prize money at stake? 
<laughs> I'm entering Susie in the contest right away. Those pie-eyed cow hands will make her the favorite. Let's drink to that. Oh, this is going to be wonderful. Say, uh, what's the baby's full name? Susie. Uh, no, no, the, the full name. I forgot to ask, but that don't matter. Now, Wyatt, the important thing is, as boss of the baby contest, where do you stand? Oh, come on, Doc. You know I can't favor one child above the other. You know that. Yeah. Poor little fatherless kid with a mother that could wring the heart of a cattle auctioneer. Doc. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Well, i tell you what I will do. I'll uh, see to it that Susie's votes are counted, honestly. Yeah. I guess I'll have to be satisfied with an honest count. Oh. Just listen to that. Why, if she's got a smile to match those tears we're in. And I don't want you to go bragging on Susie. She's a dark horse. And I want to get a few side bets down on her. <laughs> Come on, Susie. Are you sure you don't want us to help you? No. I'm a doctor. Wife, here comes the enemy. Cheap publicity. <laughs> Mr. Earp, I see no call for you to be ridiculing a leading candidate in the baby contest. Well, me? Ridicule Nettie Morris, ma'am? Why, he's one of my favorite youngsters. Hmm. Some folks say you and Dr. Fabrique have only one favorite youngster since that Smith girl came to town. Well, Doc's the one that made the entry, Mrs. Pelby. Uh, all fair and square. But our contest was meant for the hometown babies, not just any stray that comes in off the trail. Well, that baby was born in Kansas, ma'am. The lady's aide is the one that made up the rules, not me. As long as you ask me to enforce them, well, that's what I intend to do for every baby in the contest. But how do you know that child was born in Kansas? From the birth certificate, Mrs. Felby. Doc brought the birth certificate over to my office. Mrs. Beeler's due down there to check it any moment. Won't you join me? Thank you. I think I will. It's a perfectly legal birth certificate, and it seems quite in order. Sam. Thanks, ma'am. I'll just take it back to the baby's mother if you ladies are satisfied. Jenny Smith's a little worried about it. Oh, I'll return it to her, of course, and set her mind at rest, poor child. <laughs> really, Edna, you're not lining up with this girl from nowhere, too. Jenny Smith and her baby have given this contest exactly what it needed, Ruth, a sporting interest. Why, it means hundreds of dollars for the missionary fund. But her child will win, hands down. Haven't you got any local pride? Now, don't worry. I am worried. Nettie Morris is my nephew. Edna, you wrote the contest rules. Now, there must be some technicality on which we can disqualify that, that little Miss Nobody. Let me read them. Well, my copy of the rules is at home under lock and key. Our square shooting marshal took a second copy, and I doubt if he's even looked at it himself. Everything will be all right now. Just don't worry, dear. We better get out of here. Hey, Doc, how are you? How's Susie? Strong as a heifer. Huh? Well, that's good, because half the votes in the contest are being cast for. Ah. Uh, what's worrying you? Well, that's just it. Susie's the favorite all over town, but not in Denver Jones's place. You know, he's been making book on the baby contest. Got a big odds board. And he's given five to one against Susie's winning it. Well, I wonder why Denver doesn't think Susie can win it. Well, he never did take active interest in charity. He's got something up his sleeve. You can bet your bottom dollar on that. Well, let's go down and have a little look at those odds. $20 on little Susie. $20 
Morning, Marshal. Morning, Doc. Howdy. Morning, Denver. Your uh, odds are a little out of the line, aren't they? What's wrong with those odds? Take Nettie Mars there. Willing Colt, nice confirmation, biggest lungs in town. Three to one. Abby Biffle, now there's a sweet little filly. Only strawberry roan in the race. Four to one. What about that five to one against Susie Smith? She's the favorite all over town. Now, she might be your favorite, Doc. But being she's a dark horse, strange filly in town, folks don't know how fast she'll finish. You uh, have any reason to think she won't finish? Me? Of course not. But since you question my odds, Marshal, you collect the votes every night. Care to back your judgment with a little wager? Well, I won't play favorites in this contest, and I can't bet on it. You know that. But I can. And I'm betting $100 on Susie Smith to win. You got yourself a bet, Doctor. Here's another hundred on Nettie Morris. Clem Beeler just sent it in. Clem Beeler? Even Clem Beeler's betting against Susie. Well, that proves that Mrs. Beeler doesn't think Susie can win. She pulls the purse strings in that family. Yeah. She also uh, wrote the rules. Okay. Joe. Yeah? Let me see that uh, official list of rules. That's clear and simple. There's no catch there. Well. Hey, wait a minute. It's supposed to be two pages. Maybe there's another rule nobody's read. Number seven. All babies, mothers and fathers, will bring the candidates to steps of the church at six o'clock the night the contest closes, where the prize will be presented to the winner's parents. Mothers and fathers. But well, Susie hasn't got a father. No, Denver knew it. Tried to cover up that rule so nobody could read it. Look, he even shaved the edges of the paper so it wouldn't be seen. Oh. Denver? He went out the back. Let's get him. He's been giving us a dry shave. Could be he's cut his own chin. I'm gonna go over and see Susie's mother. Number seven rule mean that maybe Susie... Scratched. That's exactly what it means. But that isn't fair. It isn't her fault. And, Mr. Earp, we've just got to have that $200. Hmm? Well, how bad have you got to have it? Well, you know we're down on hard pan, Marshal. And I owe the doctor, especially for Susie's life. Can I have it bad enough to tell me where... Susie's father is? I told you, Marshal, he was killed. Now, what was he doing in the Wichita saloon the afternoon before you rode into town? He wasn't. He couldn't have been. Because he was killed. Like I told you, Pat was killed. Pat? You realize that's the first time you spoke his name? But you didn't have to. I got it off Susie's birth certificate. Patrick Smith. It was also on the trigger guard of a gun I have over in my office. The one he checked at the Wichita Hotel before he rode me down. Then you've known all along I was his wife. Pretty near. And you were figuring to follow Susie and me out of town and take him? No. no I knew a husband of a girl like you couldn't very well be a gunslinger. But I've got to try and bring him in now, Jenny. No, please don't. Pat's hot-tempered and he's outlawed. He'll fight it out and he's a dead shot, Marshal. Well, just gonna have to take that chance. And half the town bought votes for Susie to win the baby contest and the other half didn't even want her to enter. I'm the chairman. I said she qualified. They bet on my word, so I gotta qualify her. By going out and killing Pat, is that how? Well, I won't tell you where he is. Yes, you will, Jenny. Because according to the way I read these rules, they want the live father in the church steps tonight.
Pat. Pat Smith. I want to talk to you. I'm alone, Pat. I got something to tell you about your wife and daughter. Jenny got Susie to the doctor in time. She's going to be well. I got something to tell you, Marshal. Just keep your hands above the saddle where I can see them. You got the drop on me, Pat. All you got to do is pull the trigger. So go ahead, unless you want to talk things over sensibly. What's the matter, Pat? You afraid to talk? No. What is it, then? You afraid to give me an even break with the draw? That's better. Now, let's start with that money you came to town to win. Jenny and Susie have got it made. That's a lie. Not a very smart one, either. Where would they get that kind of money in such a short time? Well, it sounds crazy, but if I wanted to lie, I couldn't make up one like this. You remember that baby contest in town? Well, your wife entered Susie, and she's winning it hands down. Think I'll fall for a crazy yarn like that? Tell me something. How did you know where I was at? Jenny told me. I know you're lying now. She died before she turned me in. Well, use your head, Pat. She had to tell me. Nobody else knew where you were. And she had good reason. She doesn't want Susie's father to be an outlaw and a gunfighter. She wants to homestead like you planned. I know why you went for your gun that day in town. Your baby was hungry, and you were half crazy because of it. Yeah. Now tell me something else, Marshal. Who's going to feed her while I'm breaking rock in jail? We got no rock piles in Wichita, Pat. And you only got one night to spend in jail for breaking the no-gun law. How about riding down the Marshal? Well, I'll tell you. That Cowtown Marshal won't admit that he couldn't dodge out of the way of a horse. Not and keep his self-respect. Get on your horse. We'll head back to town. Stay where you are. You got to be back in town by 6 o'clock in order for Susie to win that contest, Pat. I only got one persuader left. Reach for your guns and you're a dead man, Herp. You wouldn't want Susie showing up for that contest without her shoes. Thank you for the blanket, Dr. Fabrice. Well, that's all right. Now, don't you go worrying about the baby. If she doesn't win the contest by herself, the blanket will. Have you ever seen anything prettier? There they are now! Well, Mr. McDonald. Is everything all right? Yeah, the marshal. Hey, we're making town. You cut it too close. We're in a hurry, you know. You want me to drive? Why, sure. Your Susie's pop up. Get on the wagon there. I'll hold the baby. Go on now. Get in. Up. Two sheets to a sheet. Here we go. Here we are now. Whoops, you doodle. Ah, that takes care of paragraph seven. Now get on over to those courthouse steps. I got a lot of money riding on that baby. <laughs> Come on, boy. Too bad you didn't get a bet down on her, Wyatt. Don't forget to put shoes on her. Never did meet a filly yet that could win a race without shoes. <laughs> Let's get on those horses and ride over there. Well, he cleaned up the country, the old Wild West country. He made law and order prevail. And none can deny it, the legend of Wyatt forever will live on the trail. Oh, Wyatt Earp, Wyatt Earp, brave, courageous, and bold. Long live his fame, and long live his glory, and long may his story be told. Long may his story be Just 
and bold. Long live his fame and long live his glory and long may his story be Short in this town, Begley. You're leaving Wichita. This ain't legal, Herb. There's nothing legal about you. Cold deck poker, watered whiskey, and extortion from dance hall girls. Now get on your horse. I'll be back. Just as soon as Josh Clanton's elected the new mayor. It'll be a cold day in July. Let's start riding. And I say to you, there's but one real issue in this campaign. And that issue is a scoundrel by the name of Wyatt Earp. That's right. Hey. 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 Only this afternoon, gentlemen, he set upon my friend, my comrade in arms, Sergeant Jim Beckley, and with his usual high-handed and insolent manner, this man, Earp, ordered Jim Beckley to leave Wichita. I tell you, my friends, this man, Earp, is the lowest type of thug. He's become the willing tool of Mayor Jim Hope. He sure has. And yeah, this yeah. unspeakable editor, Marsh Murdoch. And I promise you... Oh, that... shut up, Clanton. Get off of that wagon. I promise you, the moment that I'm elected, I'll fire Wilder. Shut up, I said, and get down from there. We'll come up and pull you off. I advise you not to try it, sir. I'm a veteran of the war, and I'm still young enough to... Hold it, Mr. Grimes. Interrupting the Colonel's meeting. But he called your names, Wyatt. All right. You can call him one name. Go ahead. Clanton, you're a dirty... liar. All right, Mr. Grimes. You can take your friends and leave the meeting. Go on. Sorry you interrupted, Colonel. The meeting's all yours. As I was saying, when deliberately interrupted by Earp and his hired killers, I do not fear the man. Any attack upon me is an attack upon all Union soldiers, living and dead. I don't understand, Wyatt. I was only trying to help. I appreciate what you're trying to do for me, Mr. Grimes, but we got to let the Colonel have his say. All right, Wyatt. But you tell Jim Hope he's liable to lose this election if he doesn't show up that blatherskite for what he really is. Well, I think you're right. And I'll tell the mayor. And tell Hannigan not to let that Clanton crowd keep our papers off the stands. Well, well, our hero himself, our plumed knight. What? Read my page one editorial. Jim Hope's meeting beat the Colonel's crowd two to one. As our late president said, you can't fool all of the... What's the matter? Don't you like what I wrote? Well, it's a little too complimentary. This is no time for modesty, Wyatt. It's a political Look, fight. Look, Mr. Murdoch, I like compliments, but uh, I don't think defending me is the line to take. You think our side is handling things wrong? That's what I'm trying to say, yes. Well, you won't stand up for your record. I have to. You want the Eagle to let Clanton lie about you without answering? Yes, sir, I do. Why? Well, because praising me is only going to make the people that don't like me more determined to vote for Clanton. I'm not the main issue. Oh, come now, Wyatt. No, Colonel Clanton's the main issue. The kind of man he is and the hoodlums that are backing him. I've got quite a file on Clanton. I was hoping I wouldn't have to use it. Tell me something. You think Mayor Hope has got it won for re-election? <laughs> he draws the biggest crowds. He's got all the good people. Sure, goodbye election. 
If you can't be that pessimistic. Look, Mr. Murdoch, all the nice people go to rallies and they cheer for Jim Hope. But two-thirds of the registered voters in Wichita live below the line. I think most of them, the way things stand now, aim to vote for Clinton. The only chance is to show up Clinton as such a skunk, they won't be able to stand the smell of them below the line. I didn't think they had any sense of smell left below the line. Well, only a few of them are out and out hoodlums. The rest of them are good people that are just too easily bamboozled by a spotter like the Colonel. If I thought it would save the mayor, I'd quit my job. Now, Wyatt. I guess it would just look like I was quitting under fire and make things worse for him. It certainly would. Well, it's your newspaper. You do what you want. I got my own work to do. Wyatt. I'm convinced. You'll open up in Clinton? With both barrels. Good. Load with buckshot. Henry! Thank you. Uh, I, I'm not well. I came to see Dr. Fabrique. Isn't, isn't his office... Uh... It's right there, man. Here. Take my arm. Yes. That's it. Now, can you walk? Yes. I took too much medicine. Nothing else. Please, believe me. I... Just take it easy, man. Of course I believe you. Watch that step. That's it. Doc! Doc! Who is it? It's Wyatt, Doc. The lady here is very sick. All right, all right. Oh, it's you, Mrs. Patton. Take her in the office, Wyatt. Right. Just take it easy. Yeah, sit on this chair. How much bromide did you take, Mrs. Clanton? I... I don't remember. Bromide? Yeah. I give it to my patients. Quiet their nerves. They keep taking it until they get themselves toxic. Colonel Clinton's wife? Yep. Drink this, Mrs. Clinton. I know you'll feel better. Sorry, Doctor, getting you up at this time of night. No, no, you forget about that, but uh, you can't go on like this, you know. About the Colonel, when are you going to make up your mind to take my advice? I can't do that now. This lady shouldn't be alone. But I guess there's no use in trying to locate the Colonel. Oh, no, you mustn't do that. I'm, I'm feeling much better. I'm not nearly so dizzy now. Yeah. But you still better let Marshal Earp drive you home. Marshal Earp, are you the man my husband says such mean things about? Well, don't let it embarrass you, Mrs. Clinton. It ain't her fault, Wyatt. Doctor. Now you go along with the Marshal. But I shouldn't trouble Mr. Earp if... And it'll look odd if we're seen together. It'll look a lot odder if you have another dizzy spell. It's going to be no trouble at all, Mrs. Clinton. Good night, Doc. Good night, Wade. Good night, Mrs. Clarkson. You should take the doctor's advice. What do you know about that? Nothing, Mrs. Clinton. What advice did the doc give you? Dr. Fabrique wants me to leave my husband. Oh. Why did I tell you that? You can go right to Mr. Murdoch at the Eagle. Well, I don't work for Mr. Murdoch, ma'am. Meaning that you won't say anything about any of this? But why wouldn't you? You have every reason to get back at the Colonel. Well, not that way. Well, I have no cause but to trust you. Dr. Fabrique and you are the only men who've been kind to me for a long time. Will you let me drive the rest of the way myself? It's only a few houses. Of course, ma'am. Oh! Look, Mrs. Clanton, it 
it's none of my business, but... Yes? Well, things are going to get awful rough around here, and... Well, you're from New York, aren't you? Couldn't you go back there on a visit? No, Mr. Earp. My husband's threatened to kill me if I try to leave him. Good night. Have you read the Eagle yet? No. I worked late last night. Well, the pot's been a bubbling in more ways than one. Oh? Huh? <laughs> Just listen to this. A snake-eyed windbag calling himself Colonel Joshua Clarton has had the unutterable gall to run for mayor of Wichita. Until today, the Eagle has let Josh rant and rave about his great feats of arms as commander of the 10th New York Volunteers in the Civil War. Now, it is time that the voters knew the real facts about this knave, poltroon, thief and scoundrel. <laughs> Who ever thought that Marsh Murdoch had it in him? <laughs> what else does he say? Huh? Where did I find the place? Oh. The record shows that the peerless commander of the 10th New York guards the draft until 1863. Then he and his dear friend, Jim Bagley, yeah, were given the choice of prison or serving in the army. They were convicted of stealing food from the wounded in the wilderness campaign, and they were both dishonorably discharged from the That's tent. Enough. But why? It's just getting juicy. I wanted to talk to you about Mrs. Clanton, but I gotta go see Mr. Murdoch. But this is the best part of it, why? I'll talk to you later. Let me attend to Murdoch, then you can wreck the place. Ah, Murdoch, I'm gonna horsewhip you. Hold it! Stand back, all of you. You're a brave man with your hired killer to protect you. Mention my name in your filthy sheet once more and I'll shoot you down like a dog. Remember, Earp, you heard what I said. I gave him fair warning. Take your men away from here, Clinton. Next time, I'll come back alone. With a gun. Come on, gentlemen. Never mind that, Henry. We've got an extra with a noon deadline. Hey, you're fighting mad. That's good. Hey, you, uh, you just better wear that. But that coward? Oh, I've seen men that are frightened turn to gunplay when they're cornered. All right. I'm dead serious, Mr. Murdoch. I kind of talked you into that rampage against Clanton. I want you to wear that at all times. It'll make you feel better, Wyatt. Now I've got to send an extra to press. Talk about it later. What's worrying you? What I wanted to talk to you about before was Mrs. Clanton. She told me last night she advised her to leave her husband. It's a private communication between a patient and her doctor. Yeah? Well, Clanton threatened to kill her. That puts it in my department. <laughs> Josh ain't never had the nerve to kill anybody. It's what Marsh Murdoch thinks. Look, Doc, this uh, political row is getting out of hand. Maybe if I can talk Mrs. Clanton into calming her husband down, I can ride herd on Murdoch. Murdoch was always a meek and mild man to make a good editor. But now, just when he's dipping his arrows in poison, you want to ruin his whole career. See, there's no point in talking with you. Certainly ain't. I'm going to go over and see Mrs. Clinton. Good. I hope the Colonel catches you at it. Then we'll have some rail shooting. Doc, you have such a gentle soul. Uh -huh. <sighs> I'm Marshal Earp, man. Mrs. Clanton home? Yes, but I don't think she'll want to see you. Dora, who is it? It's Mr. Wyatt Earp, and I already told him. No, Dora, I'll talk to Mr. Earp. Yes, she changed her mind.
It's all right, Dora. If your husband's home, I'd like to talk to both of you. How had you the impudence to come here after this article in the paper? What article? I suppose you know nothing about it. No, I don't. It insinuates that my illness is a thing that should be hidden. That because I'm never seen with my husband, I'm a skeleton in his closet. It even insinuates that perhaps I drink. A fit mate for Private Clanton, a fraudulent warrior. Oh. I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Clanton. I, I just can't imagine Mr. Murdoch printing a story like this. Is that so hard to believe when you went right to him with your story? I didn't tell him anything about you. I didn't even mention that we'd met. Why, then it was Dr. Fabrique. No. No, he wouldn't answer any of my questions about you. Does the story mention the fact that you want to leave your husband, but you're afraid to because he threatens you? No. Well, politically, that's even a more damaging story than this. I'm sorry, Mr. Earp. I've been so heartsick about everything. Well, I don't blame you. And Mr. Murdoch will print a retraction. I'll go right over to his office. Marshal, Dr. Fabrig thinks you'd better come right away. Mr. Murdoch's been shot. Who did it? We don't know. It's in the lung and Doc won't let him talk. Was he in any danger? Doc wouldn't say. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Er, really very sorry. Has your husband been home today? I may need to talk to you later. Yes, of course. Marsh Murdoch, editor of the Wichita Eagle, was shot and superficially wounded at 7.15 last night by Jim Begley, a henchman of Private Josh Clanton. Begley was accompanied to the Eagle office by Clanton. Private Clanton tried to do the shooting himself, but lost his nerve. And Begley then drew his own weapon and fired. It was Begley, huh? Yes. Can you get that story over to my office, why? You better get out of here. You're making his temperature go up. If you don't stop shouting, you're going to make his temperature go up. What? Forget it. Would you like a little nip? I've been looking for you, Marshal. Colonel Clanton gave me his gun. He owns up that he did it. Oh? Well, you plead guilty to the charge? Proudly. I shot Murdoch in defense of my wife's honor. Take him to jail, Sam. I demand an immediate hearing before Judge Jewett. That's for Judge Jewett to decide, not you. Now go on. I was only 19. He was a war hero, an older man, so I was an infatuated fool and married him. All he wanted was a young wife and the money my folks left me. Well, he'll soon be a real hero. He shot my friend in defense of your good name. But Mr. Murdoch said it was that Begley fellow. It's just his word against your husband's. Unless I find Begley. But that's terrible, Mr. Erb. Why, what does Josh Clanton care for me or my reputation? He's disgraced me with women. He keeps me like a prisoner in my own house. Well, Mrs. Clanton, the voters don't know that. Do you mean he might actually be elected mayor? If he gets away with the lie of the injured husband, he can't lose. But he's got to lose. I'll announce I'm leaving him. I'll tell the whole story of why. It's too late for that now. Oh, I, I never dreamed he stood a chance of being elected. I despised him so I thought surely the public would see him as I do. Mrs. Clanton, I've got to find Bailey. Can you help me? Oh, I want to, really, I do, but I, I know so little about the man. He brought my husband home several times late at night, but I wouldn't begin to know where to find him. Well, if you do hear from Begley or hear anything about him, will you let me know? 
Yes, of course. Good night, Mrs. Clinton. Can't you explain to Jim the legal rule that ties my hand? He knows the law, Judge. I'm only asking you to stretch it a little and not let that scoundrel have a chance to strut in court. He's pleaded guilty. He's demanded an immediate hearing and sentence. And the law clearly states that I must give him his day in court to allow him to present extenuating circumstances that might lighten his punishment. It's no use, Jim. Marshal, there's a lady here to see you. She wouldn't give me your name. No, I think I know her name. You better let me talk to her alone. We wait outside. Send her in, Wayne. Yes, sir. Could you come in, please? Good morning, ma'am. It's Begley. He's at the house. Oh? He wanted money, $500. I told him I'd have to go to the bank. Good. You think he'll wait? Oh, I was frightened of him. He knew it. He's sure I'll come back with the money. Good. He has a gun, Mr. Earp. That's wonderful. That's the best news of all. Start until you got your hand on your gun. You want to kill me? I ain't drawn. Erp, you're going loco? You wouldn't shoot me with my hands up, would you? You shot a good friend of mine. Now get outside. Oh, no. Sorry, Mrs. Clinton. I guess I lost my temper. Oh, you tell the truth, Bill. Get him to the court. Hurry. You can take my rig. Thank you, ma'am. Murdoch called the woman I loved a drunker. Dr. Fabrique has testified that Mrs. Clinton suffered a nervous breakdown. She took sodium bromide by his prescription. Bromide, sir, a sedative, not an intoxicating liquor. My darling wife has never tasted even so much as a spoonful of wine. Mr. Clanton, I take it that you're offering the plea of extreme provocation for this court to consider. I make no plea, sir. I did what any decent husband would do. Your Honor, Mr. Begley's got a statement to make to the court. I shot Murdoch. Josh tried to, but he lost his nerve. That's a lie, sir. A contemptible lie. Will you repeat that statement under oath in this court? Yes, sir. <laughs> Very well. Hold up your right hand. This will go on page one. The Wichita Eagle most sincerely apologizes to Mrs. Harriet Clanton and retracts in its entirety the story printed about her two days before the election. The Eagle bows its head in shame. During the heat of a political contest, the Eagle was careless in its facts concerning Mrs. Clanton and grossly unjust in its interpretation of those facts. The Eagle and its editor have learned a lesson we shall never forget. Is there anything else I can say, ma'am? No, Mr. Murdoch. Thank you very much. Mr. Earp is seeing you to the station. It'll be my pleasure. Well, he cleaned up the country, the old Wild West country. He made law and order prevail. And none can deny it, the legend of Wyatt forever will live on the trail. Oh, Wyatt Earp, Wyatt Earp, brave, courageous, and bold. Long live his fame, and long live his glory, and long may his story be
The summer of 75 was Wyatt Earp's second year as deputy marshal in the Trails End cow town of Wichita, Kansas. During that first violent summer, Wyatt had grabbed the town by the tail and held it on the ground, while hundreds of armed and defiant cowboys from the cattle trails tried to keep it on the prod. But even though Wichita had learned to keep its hair slicked, Wyatt still liked to spend his mornings near the cattle pens, watching what might have drifted in overnight. Hey, you uh, seen old man coming around lately? No, and it ain't like him either. All summer long he's been meeting his herd. Always here to beat me for the best price. And getting it, too. Well, after all, he's my best customer. You might as well be honest about it, Mr. Santel. Cattle kings don't come any tougher than old man Cullen. Good morning, Brad. Where's your father? He's selling a herd to the army over at Dodge. He'll be back in a few days. Now, does anybody know Mr. Santel? I'm Santel, boy. What's on your mind? Well, uh... I'm Brad Cullen. I'm trail boss of that herd there. I'd like to talk some business. You? Yeah, that's right, me. One of Cullen's sons. He's got authorization to sell the herd. Why doubt him? Well, no offense, kid, but I just couldn't imagine your old man letting anyone handle a sale for him. Am I forgiven? Guess you want to ride into town, get washed up. Well, after I talk business. You fellas go ahead. I'll ride back with you when you get all done. How many? Five hundred. Hmm. That's closer to four. No, no, I said five hundred. The lame and the blind ones, hmm? Hey, what's that? They've come a long way over grazed out lands and dried streams. I wouldn't call them prime beef. Now, I'm offering you 500 prime beeves at 20 a head. The market's glutted. Prices drop to $10 a head. You can take it or leave it. Now, look, mister. Are you trying to take advantage of me? Because if you are... Your old man will come gunning for me, hmm? Look, kid, your pappy don't scare me one bit. At least so long as Wyatt Earp's close by somewhere to help me out. I don't happen to be so lucky. Oh. All right. Seeing as it's Cullen beef I'm buying, I'll make it 15. Well, it's got to be 20. Believe me, kid, I'm not bluffing and I'm not gouging. Buying season's over. I'm being as generous as I can and I'm doing it for you, not for that great hard rock who happens to be your old man. Give me an hour to think it over. An hour to see some other brokers? Sure. You won't get a cent over 10. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you three hours. Ready? How'd you make out with Mr. Santel? He said the price is down. That's true. Oh, then I'm in for it. If I sell the herd short, Pompa like they kill me. If I don't, he'll rag me and hound me till I feel like killing him. He can be a miserable man over money. How old are you, Brad? Going on 19. <sighs> Got you that, Buffalo. Why don't you just... Pack up and get out like your older brothers did. Well, I'm the only one left. It's just me and Ma. I guess I'm the reason that she's staying around. She asking you to? Well... Now you're fooling yourself. You're afraid of your old man. That's all that's trouble with you. You're still a kid. All right, I'll admit it. So I'm a kid. Okay, suppose I have your advice, Mr. Herb. What would you do if you were me? Well, if I was you, I'd uh, go into town, get myself a square meal, and I'd make up my mind and stand pat in my decision. Oh, just as simple as that, huh? Yep. Make up your mind to something. Being a man is just that simple. Come on, we'll go into town.
Would you make out? Hey, if you mind. Yep. Ah. That's a heavy piece of paper to be carrying around all by yourself. Better ride out to your camp on Cowskin Creek, where you'll be among friends. What's the matter? Aren't you my friend? Well, that goes without saying, Brad, but that stuff's not. You uh, want me to hang on to it for you? You know, the more you talk, the more you sound like my old man. The more you sound like him, the less I like you. Now, you just go ahead with your business. I'll take care of mine. OK, Brent. I guess you're the boss. I'll see you around. Cards, please. Three to you. Three, please. One. Two to the dealer. a couple of hours ago, right after you left. Has he been buying? No. Them was his original chips. For a kid, he's doing real good. Your bet. I call. I'm 50 better than you, mister. I can't. You took uh, one card, I believe, didn't you, son? You're supposed to follow the play, mister, not ask questions. A young man raised you 50, either put up or drop out. You're too young to bluff, kid. But in case you are, I'm willing to pay to teach you not to. What have you got? Hard flush. You lose. Jack's full. You care to join me for a drink, Mr. Huh? No, thanks. How'd you come out? I came out with nothing but my name, Mr. Earp, sir. And you lost the whole check, $7,500? Mm, yep. But I admit to that with a certain pardonable pride. What'd you figure you'd do? Get lucky and run that check up to what your father expected? Yeah. And you would have lied to him and told him you got more for the herd than you really did, is that it? Mm. Yeah. You're even more scared of the old man than I thought. Well, now what do you tell him? The truth. Just tell the truth. In other words, you'd rather admit to being the bad gambler than a bad businessman, is that it? Well, that's about it, Mr. Bad luck of saw can happen to anybody. But a bad business deal, well, that's stupid, unforgivable. Don't you ever darken my door again, son. Ah. You better face up to it, Bradger. 
Father isn't going to believe that gambling story any more than I do. You played for a sucker. A sucker? That's right, sucker. Even though your father would rather admit to a bad business deal than being played for a sucker by two tin horns. Uh, what are you talking about? Those two gamblers, they play it like a partnership. Either one of them gets a good hand, they bet it up. If you get a good hand, they fold. Their winnings are big, yours are small. Percentage wise, they get all the edge. Even you ought to be able to see who's going to come out the winner. You, you mean they, they work together, they split afterwards? That's right. They. Well, that means I've been robbed. Well, what are you going to do to get back my money? Nothing. Foster and his friend didn't break any laws. I got no legal grounds to make an arrest. But well, what they did was wrong, and you know it. <laughs> the whiskey's gone to your head. And you better go back to Cowskin Camp where you can sleep it off. Come on, I'll take you there myself. Oh, you coward, Mr. Herb. You protector of cheats and robbers. You're a big man with the six-gun, too, aren't you? Well, would you just show me how good you are? Huh? Well, that's not a very smart play, Brad. Throwing down on a man with a gun you're not used to. Now, let me have it. Come on. Come on, straighten up like a man. Look at Brad, boys. He sure tied one on. Yeah, and that ain't all. I was robbed, cheated, beaten up, and thrown in jail. Robbed? Yeah, that's right. Robbed, I was cleaned out. They took the check, the payroll, the money, everything. Didn't you go to the law? Ah, of course I did. And I'm the one that gets thrown in jail. I'm going to put it to you straight. I'm for going back into the town and getting what's mine and yours. But I need help. Uh, anybody want to volunteer? My mammy always told me the good Lord helps those that help themselves. I'm with you, kid. Always did want a chance to tree Wichita. Count me in, too. Okay. All right, we'll all join. All right. Come on, okay, come on, let's go then. Come on. Still here. Everyone keep their hands on the table. This is not a holdup. I was cheated at cards last night by these two men. All I want is the money I lost. Give me my check, mister. Well, I don't have it here, son. It's locked up in the house safe in the back room. Well, get in cash. 7,500. I don't have that much on me. You get it, Foster. I'm telling you, you get it from the other tables. I want 7,500 or I'm going to kill you. That's 2,000, Mac. Consider it a loan. How much you got, Hal? Let's see. Here's five. This will make up the rest of it. Make it quick, gambler, or you'll lose some of them clever fingers. There you are.
We gotta let him get away with this. The charge is armed robbery. Is that right, Mr. Foster? Armed robbery, attempted murder. Mr. Haversham was seriously wounded, you know. Now, there's no need to be so self-righteous, Mr. Foster. Your neck's not as clean as it could be either, you know. You cheated that kid the same as if you'd stacked the deck. If you think I've done anything illegal, why don't you arrest me? Well, sometimes there's a better way to take care of men like you. What are you up to, Earp? Well, I'll tell you this much, Mr. Foster. I'll arrest Brad Cullen and his punches as your request and bring him to trial. But by the time this is over, the whole town will know how you and your friend operate. I may not be able to touch you legally, but the average citizen still has a sense of fair play. These warrants are ready to sign, Mr. Foster. Right on this line, please. How many more men will we need, Wyatt? I'll make the arrest myself. You can't go into that cow camp alone. Well, I'll tell you, Sam. Brad Cullen and his men aren't hardened criminals. The best way to handle a thing like this is to treat it like a family quarrel. All right, Mr. Foster. Let me have a warrant. Mighty convenient if one of Brad's cowboys dropped him, wouldn't it? Are you out of your mind, Foster? No, but I'm thinking. I'm thinking about who'd be getting blamed if Earp was found dead between here and Cullen's ranch. We made it. He's still a couple of miles from camp. Between us, we'll get him. didn't want us alive to make a point, he'd drop us here. We'll do what you say. When you get the witch you talk, keep on going. Hey, Brad. Who is that, son? That's, uh, Wyatt Earp. You stay where you are. I'll talk to him. Morning, Mr. Cullen. Morning, Wyatt. See, you got here a little ahead of time. An hour ago. We're, um... Just about to pack and head south. What's on your mind, Wyatt? I got warrants for the arrest of Bradshaw Cullen and six John Doe's for the cowhands who helped them hold up the Texas house this morning. Why, he was just taking back the money that he'd been robbed of. 
Seeing as how the law wouldn't give him a helping hand. How did Brad tell you he lost some money in the first place? Well, he had a few drinks. Played some poker. He said he lost quite a sum of money before he found he was being cheated. Said you wouldn't even listen to it. You're not arresting anyone from this camp, Wyatt. I'm arresting your son and six cow hands, Mr. Cullen. Now get out of my way. Brad, tell him the truth. You'll never get another chance like this one. What's he talking about, son? Oh, yeah, he's just stalling, Pop. You watch him now. Your son's a liar, Mr. Cullen. Get him, Brad, get him! You ought to drop, you fool! Why don't you shoot? He couldn't shoot me last night when he was drunk, and he can't shoot me now when he's sober. Because he knows he's wrong. It's hard to kill a man when you're wrong, isn't it? Thanks. Pop? I lied, Pop. I sold the herd short of what you wanted and tried to make it up gambling. The rest is like I told you. You sold a herd. That's right. The funny thing is, I'm not afraid to admit it. Not now. Not anymore. I was a coward, a liar, and a thief. I was all that just to please you. What kind of a son are you? What are you talking about? You'll never do this to me again, Pop. I'm not coming home anymore. Mr. Rip, I'll go saddle me up a horse and then we can go. I, you don't have to take the other boys in. They didn't know the truth. I'm the only one you want. I don't understand, Wyatt. My sons. Three of them now. Gone. I, I work my fingers to the bone to give them a future. And they leave. Tell me why, Wyatt. I don't understand. I guess that's been the trouble, Mr. Cullen. There comes a time when a young fella has to move out. Learn to be somebody all by himself. I guess you uh, just never learned one to let go. Where's Foster and his friend? They rode out for Dodge early this morning. They left this for you. It's that check of young Collins. They said they wouldn't hold any charges against them if you'd return their money. And they wish you to return the compliment and leave them alone if you ever meet up with them again. They left their forwarding address on the back. Huh? Thank you, Judge. Wait, I'll have one with you. Well, he cleaned up the country, the old Wild West country. He made law and order prevail. And none can deny it, the legend of Wyatt forever will live on the trail. Oh, Wyatt Earp!
When Wyatt Earp was Marshal of Wichita, Kansas in 1875, one of the serious problems with which he had to deal was the runaway boy from the East. Hundreds of such youngsters, incited by lurid dime novels about cowboys, Indians, and outlaws, left their homes in eastern towns and cities for the wild, exciting life of the western frontier. If today's comic books have a bad effect on many juvenile readers, they are mild compared to the bloody sensationalism of paperback thrillers, which lured the youth of earlier times to seek adventure in the brawling violence of cattle trail and cow town. <laughs> Punk. Are you using real bullets? I got several of that lazy H out there. Oh, well, you did, huh? Well, they all uh, seem to be standing up. You the sheriff, mister? No, I'm the marshal. Who are you? My name's Tim Jones, and I'm with the Bar W's. You know, we had our loading orders first, and then those lazy H's tried to jump our claim. You took a shot at me. Oh, I didn't see your star. I thought you were lazy H. I don't shoot the law. Oh, now that's... That's real considerate. Come on. Is he shooting? Yeah, without a license. This one's sober. We'll take him back to town with the rest of them. Does a cowhand get a fair trial in this town, or do they lynch him? Your size, we spank. Anybody get hurt? No. They're too drunk to get hurt, most of them. I wish people would keep their kids at home. I got another desperate Desmond on my hands. Runaway boy, huh? Yeah. It's a wonder he didn't pink somebody or hurt himself. Just the kids? Mm -hmm. This is the worst yet. They're coming west by the hundreds. We've had at least a couple of dozen in the last few months. Can't you get something in the Eastern papers about it? I've tried, Wyatt. I think it's just normal kid behavior. In fact, they're rather proud. Proud? Proud of what? Young America, the spirit of the pioneers. You know the line. Well, I've got something to show you. Sam. Sam, bring that young Tim Jones in, will you? Now, the spirit of the pioneers is fine. But I've yet to see a runaway kid with a hoe. They all want to be gunfighters. It's those dime novels they read. Ned Buntline and his daredevil of the plains. Yeah, written by men that have never been west of Albany. I wish I could see what it does to some of their readers. Well, take a good look at it, Mr. Murdoch. Young America. Hey, you the judge? No, it's Mr. Murdoch. He happens to be the editor of the Wichita Eagle. Hey, I don't want my name or my picture in the paper. Oh, don't worry, you're not that important. Now go sit down. Where do your folks live? Haven't any folks. Who's your relative? No relatives. Just write it down that I'm a cowpuncher working for the Bar W outfit. The Bar W outfit doesn't hire kids. You jumped off a freight train. I don't want any more fresh talk from you. Well, we've got to send you home. Where is that? None of your business. Don't get sassy with Mr. Earp, kid. OK. I'm a homeless juvenile vagrant. I'm an orphan without any means of support. Well, that's too bad. We'll uh, have to put him out for adoption. Yeah. Mr. Bodine at the dairy would like to have another orphan. Forty cows to milk twice a day. Only three kids to do it. Think you're tough enough for that? Well, I want to be a cow hand. You know, ride the range, punch cows. Well, you can milk cows at the dairy. No, if my father were here, he'd, he'd just turn me loose. You do have a father, huh? No, I don't. Bend over the desk. What? You heard me. I said bend no! over the desk. No! Oh, wait, I'll tell you! All right. My father's Timothy Jones, Sr. He lives at the Fifth Avenue Hotel in New York City. New York, huh? You've come a long way. 
I'll send a wire for you, Wes. Thanks. I'll be here in a few hours. My father will fix you for using corporal punishment on me. No one's allowed to do that. You're just a big country Jake sheriff. And you're a spoiled brat. I guess you might as well start learning. Learning what? To be a cowhand. That's what you came west for, isn't it? Yeah. Where do we go now? We're going to a little cowhand school. I run it just for boys like you. Now, the first thing a cowhand has to learn is how to ride a horse. I already know. Oh, you do, huh? Sure. Come here. It's on this side. Turn him loose. All right, Mr. Jones. Hurry. Show him. No, I think you had enough. I want to try him again. All right. But this time, keep your heels out of his flank. Uh, you stayed on him a lot time longer, Kyan. You want to try him again? No. That horse doesn't like me. Uh, well, we'll forget about riding for the time being. But Cow has got to learn how to rope. That's a lasso. Give it here. I'll show you how to bust a steer. Oh? First, you tie one end of the rope around your waist. Then, you loop, open the loop at the end like this. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's good. You stay right here, and I'll uh, go get a steer and let him out of the chute. You can rope him. How big a steer? Oh, just about your size. Those aren't steers. Those are calves, little doggies. Well, you just go ahead and try and rope him. I'll show you. Mr. Jones, you're aiming at the wrong end. Come here. Now you go up and uh, climb up on that fence over there and drop the loop over their head. That's not the proper way to do it. Well, it's the proper way for a cow hand on foot. Now you go climb up. Go okay. On. Are you all set? Yeah. I'll shoot one by it for you. Come on, Dougie. Go on. Ow, it burns my hands. <laughs> Untie the rope. Whoa, boy. Now, well, let's see. Uh, first, you tie the rope around your waist. You well, I thought that was the way you now, did. Now, look, you can't rope and you can't ride. What can you do? I'm tired and I'm hungry. Well, a good cow hand can always eat. But you're uh, a little dirty. You gotta get you scrubbed up first. Oh, no. Oh, yes. This water's too cold. I catch pneumonia. It's good for you. No! It's too cold. Oh! Now, you know what that is? Farm tool of some kind. Kansas, we call it a hole. This is what you do with it. Now, you try it. Not me. That's hard labor. No work, no eat. But it has nothing to do with being a cowhand. They don't chop down weeds with hoes. Yes, they do. They clean the corrals with pitchforks, too. They squat on dirty cows and burn their hide with a brand and iron. Hard labor. Well, you ought to see what... They look like after a week of riding in the brush and alkali dust on a roundup. They stink, Mr. Jones. I got no more time to waste on you. you go buy your lunch from the jailer. Hi, Margo. Hi, Sam. 
message came a while ago from Mr. Murdoch. Uh -huh. That New York business. Oh, read it to me, will you? No, Timothy Jones, registered at Fifth Avenue Hotel. Thanks. Now, we may be country jakes, but at least we try and tell the truth. I've even taken the word of an outlaw killer like Ben Thompson, and he kept it, but I can't take yours. There's nobody registered by the name of Timothy Jones at the Fifth Avenue Hotel. They never heard of him. All right, go ahead. No. I'd rather be spanked than listen to you call me a liar and no good brat. All right, then. What's your father's real name? I'm not going to tell you. Why not? You telegraph him, and then you send detectives after me. I'm not going home. I hate it there. All right, you hate your home. I still have to know where you live. Look, I obeyed you. I took a bath. I tried to stay on that horse. I got dragged by a dogie, and I hold wheat. It's more than I did for anybody else. Now I'm through with you. Mr. Jones, sit down. You happen to be a runaway boy, and the law says it's my job to get you home. Do you understand that? Can't do that if I won't tell you where I live. All right. You take this note over to the clerk at the Texas house. Here's the key to my room. Get yourself a bite to eat, and you stay at the hotel. Ten. When I get off work, we'll have a long talk. When will that be? Uh, eight or nine, maybe later. I'm trusting you to stay there. I'll run away. No, you won't. How do you figure that? Uh, most kids want to be good. You can't be any different than the rest of them. I'm sure you want to be a cowhan. You want to follow Ned Buntline's Wild Westers. But why run away from home to do it? You've got plenty of time for that when you grow up. Why make such a secret out of where you live? Your father can't be that bad. I'll see you at the hotel, mister. Are you sure you saw the kid going here? Yeah, he ate by himself and then he went in. Railroad detective, Hannibal of St. Joseph. What can I do for you? You got a lad about 14 years old staying here? He's a nice looking boy. He's about that tall. Brown hair, blue eyes. Oh, yes, Timothy Jones. He's in care of Marshal Earp. Timothy Jones? Mm -hmm. Where can we find him? You better talk to Marshal Earp. He's usually here by now. Thank you. We'll be back. Are you Mr. Earp? No, it's Mr. Davis, the clerk. Oh. Two railroad detectives were just here. They asked about you. What'd you tell them? Well, I told them they should talk to Mr. Earp. But he asked me to make sure you stayed in the hotel. Thank you, sir. I'll stay right here. Tom Sheriff better keep his nose out of it. Mister, mister, help me. Hold it. Let him go. You keep out of this. We're railroad detectives. They're kidnapping me. Well, I don't care who you are, you're under arrest. Yeah? Hold it. Kill them both, mister. Now you get back to the hotel and stay there. Go on. All right, go pick up your friend. Go on. You'll be.
be sorry for this. That's Big Tim Callahan's son. And who is Callahan? He's the president of the Hannibal St. Joe Railroad. You're in trouble, you stupid Jayhawk. Yeah? Let's start him over to Doc Fabrique's office. Hey, where's Callahan from? Chicago. He'll be headed here in his private car. Or did you refuse to let his men wire him? No, they wired him. Look, this is serious, my friend. Well, look, I happen to think I'm right. Morally, yes, but you rousted that kid of his around, buffaloed one of his men, and shot the other one. Lord knows what Callahan will accuse you of. Hey, that reminds me. What? I promise to have a talk with this kid. Now, wait. I think you and I should have a talk with Judge Jewett and Mayor Hope. This is more important. Well, I happen to think that the boy is a lot more important than the old man. The boy's the one that's got the real trouble. You hate everybody, don't you? First you take a shot at me, and then you want those detectives killed, and now your father. What has your dad done to you that you're so willing to turn into a little tramp? Everybody's against me. The old man, most of all. So I'm against them. Why do you think your father's against you? You don't even know me. It's never home. He believes my stepmother. Everything she says is right. Your stepmother's against you, huh? She hates me. Every time my dad hires a teacher I get along with, she waits until dad's on a trip and then she fires him. Does your dad travel a good deal? Most of the time. Then the servants keep me locked up in that big old house. Well, that's not enough reason to go around hating people, Timmy. It's not, huh? I thought I wanted to be your friend once, but you're just like all the rest. Bart W. Alfred, you stay away from that window. Boys, hustle those men in. Go on. Let me see that arm, Timmy. Who are you? Now try and stand up. That's it. Just take it easy. What's your name? Uh, let me see. Now we better go see Doc Fabric. I'm Jim Callahan. This is my boy. You almost ran him down. What are you trying to do? Run those horses into gunfire? Mind your own business. Don't get sassy with Mr. Earp, Dan. Why, Ed Earp? I thought so. You're the cowtown genius. Don't move that arm any more than you have to. Just keep your right hand on it. Doc's office is just up the street. Don't you ignore me. I haven't started in you on you stop yet. Stop jabbering. I'm going to start in on you. Now pick up the boy's hat and let's go. Come on. Take it easy. I'm the boy's father. You understand? I'm his father. So I arrive at Wichita, and what do I find? Excuse me. A gun battle waging on the main street. And my son, Timmy, right in the middle of it. Two of my detectives in jail. One of them seriously wounded by Wyatt Earp. And when I offer a mild protest, Mr. Earp threatens me. Is this the way you run things in your town? Your detectives resisted arrest, Mr. Callahan. And your son refused to give his right name and address. My time is valuable, and I'm not going to waste it arguing in a small-time court like this. Oh, you're not. I demand that Herb be dismissed immediately. Your wishes are not law in Wichita. All right. Then I charge Herb with cruel and inhuman treatment of my son, if you haven't any law against that. 
and then I'll bring suit against the city for civil damages. I'm going to sue you for $50,000. Now, hold on. Cruel and inhuman treatment of a child is punishable under our criminal code. Well, well. I'm astonished. This court is not interested in your personal reaction. Have you any testimony to present against Marshal Earp? I most certainly have. Mr. Becker and Mr. Dean tell me that Earp forced my son to ride a dangerous horse, that he tied him to a steer and allowed the steer to drag him around, and then forced him to hoe weeds in the jail yard for hours. These are the facts, Your Honor. It's all wrong, Judge. It's not the way it happened. It's all a pack of lies. Now, now, son, you keep out of this. Order. Uh, step over here, young man. Well, surely you're not going to listen to a mere child, an irresponsible lad who doesn't... Sit down, work. Mr. Callahan. Move over. Uh, sit down here, son. Now, Timmy, suppose you tell the court whether you've been treated cruelly or inhumanly by Marshal Earp. No, sir, I wasn't. Uh, did he force you to ride a dangerous horse? No, it was all part of the cowhand school. Cowhand school? Mr. Earp runs it for spoiled kids who leave home and think they'd like to be cowhands. Oh, I see. Well, the horse and the little calf, they were all part of the lesson. Hoeing weeds was part of it, too. But the best part is, after Mr. Earp gives you the acid test, he treats you like a man. He trusts you. He doesn't let servants lock you up or put detectives on your trail. Then you have no complaint the way you've been treated since you've been here? No, sir. Can I stay here with Mr. Earp? Please, Judge. Couldn't Mr. Earp adopt me or something? Timmy, you don't mean that. Yes, I do. Mr. Earp doesn't hate me. I lied to him and acted fresh. But he doesn't hate me. That's all I want, just not to be hated. Timmy, I don't hate you. I love you. Why would you say such a thing as that? All I've ever wanted to do is to protect you and keep you from harm. Mr. Earp, I don't know how to say this, but I hope you'll forgive me. I didn't mean what I said. Sometimes a man just doesn't quite Your understand. Honor, uh, with the court's permission, I think that Mr. Callahan, Timmy and I uh, can work this out together. Very well. Court's adjourned. I think this horse likes me now. That's the secret, huh, Mr. Herb? Oh, the secret is that uh, you like the horse. I sure do. As soon as my arm gets well, I'm going to learn how to ride him just like Mr. Herb does. I think it's time Dad learned how to rope little doggies. Uh -oh. Don't you, Marshal Herb? Uh, that's right. All right, Jimmy. Uh... Uh, just how do you go about uh, roping one of them uh, doggies? Well, uh, it's simple. First, you tie the rope around your waist. This one? Yes. All right. Tie the rope around him, Mr. Herb. Well, OK. Now, I'll let a little doggie out, and you sit on the fence, Dad, and then you drop the loop around the doggie's neck. OK? <laughs> All right. I'll let the little doggy out. Right up here, huh? That's right. Right up there. Yeah. Well, it seems very simple to me. Oh, it is. It's uh, very simple. I'll get him the first time out. <laughs> Turn that doggy loose. Well, he cleaned up the country, the old Wild West country. He made law and order prevail. And none can deny it, the legend of Wyatt forever will live on the trail. Oh, Wyatt Earp, Wyatt Earp, brave, courageous, and bold. Long live his fame and long live his glory and long may his story be.